It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is to the uh, Deputy Premier. Late yesterday evening, after reporters headed home for the day, the government dropped a bombshell on three communities in the GTA. For years, Milton, Markham and Brampton have been planning for university campuses in their communities to provide opportunity for their children and to train a future workforce for their growing economies. Last night, this government pulled the plug on those dreams in the dead of the night. What justification can they offer for this decision? Deputy Premier. Yeah, through training colleges and universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We promised the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and part of that process means making tough decisions about projects across Ontario. Our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial decisions of the previous Liberal government. We know now, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. Shame. To describe the previous government's actions, the Auditor General used words like conceal, bogus, deceptive, and unreliable. In an election year, they made promises, empty promises, to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew they could not afford leading to a $15 billion deficit Response. while hiding the cost from the public. The Liberals have shattered the trust of Ontario. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, I want to quote one uh, local expert on the importance of these campuses. Speaking of the New York University campus in Markham, he said, and I quote, there are just a few numbers of the impact of the new camp campus will make. 4,200 students will have access to teaching, learning, and research. 400 plus on-campus jobs. 500 million in economic benefits. The campus will benefit many residents of Markham and York Region, allowing them to gain the skills and knowledge in order for them to be part of the 21st century economy of Ontario, end quote. That expert was PC MPP Billy Pang, wow. the, minister, uh, the member for Markham Unionville, uh, who was speaking in this House just weeks ago. Why is this government depriving these communities of economic investment and opportunity for their kids? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government was elected to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and that's exactly what we're doing. Due to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government are now clear. In an election year, the Liberals made empty political promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew the province could not afford, hiding the costs from the public and creating $15 billion deficit that Ontario has today. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on cleaning up the irresponsible Spons. and reckless financial decisions of the previous government and restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. Thank you. Stop the start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, the former government may have shattered people's trust, and I agree with that, but this government's shattering their dreams, Speaker. Okay. Shattering their dreams. These are growing communities, growing communities that deserve post-secondary opportunities for their kids. But now that the votes are counted, this government seems to think that they're second class. PC candidates spent the last campaign promising that these campuses would go ahead. During the campaign, the MPP for Milton said, and I quote, we will do everything we can to make this project a reality, whether it takes 90 million or there's more we need to do, end quote. The MPP for Markham actually went to the groundbreaking ceremony of the new Markham campus. I guess this truly is a case of promises made, promises broken. That's right. Why did the government break their word to the parents and students in these communities who were promised a university? Minister. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. And quite frankly, I reject the premise of the question. We have been clear that this government is committed to enhancing the financial accountability and transparency. The previous Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, Always. who supported them on 97 per cent of their votes, made empty promises in an election year for programs and projects that they knew they could not afford, leading to a $15 billion deficit Opposition while hiding the order. cost from the public. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances, and that is what we will do. Thank you, Speaker. Start the clock. Next question. Leader the Speaker, my next question is for the Deputy Premier. Working people in Ontario are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. They find too many of today's jobs are unreliable and underpaid. They're, lack, uh, they're looking to their government to ensure that they have uh, their basic benefits and that they get an honest day pay for an honest day's work. Instead of providing that, this government announced their plans yesterday to take basic benefits away. Can the Deputy Premier explain why a woman working full-time on the minimum wage should have her wages frozen? Deputy Premier. Economic development. For economic development. Speaker, and uh, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, as the honourable member will know, uh, we promised to make Ontario open for business, and yesterday was a great big step. A great big step in the right direction. A great big step in the right direction to do just that. While the party opposite might be concentrating as the Liberals did for 15 years, propped up by the NDP, concentrating on propping up a minimum wage economy. Mr. Speaker, we need to get beyond that. We need to get better jobs, better paying jobs. We can't give up on our manufacturing sector. They gave up on our manufacturing sector. Premier Ford, I, our caucus, our party, we're going to revive those jobs in manufacturing and in our industrial sector. And to do that, we needed to get rid of the job-killing parts of Bill 148, and that's what we did. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, working people aren't asking for luxuries. They're asking for the bare minimum basics, Speaker. <laughs> to, take, to take a sick day without having to lose a day's pay. To enjoy their day off without being ordered to show up for a shift for fear of losing their job, to make a living wage of $15 an hour. Most employers that I meet are happy to extend these basic benefits to their staff. Why is the government rolling back these basic benefits? Mr. Economic Development. Uh, speaker, we're not rolling back the basic benefits of an employer. Uh, wants to extend those benefits, so they're perfectly happy happy to do so. And a lot of employers are. Most employers are by far. Most employers aren't paying minimum wage. They can't get help at minimum wage. So, the fact of the matter is, uh, what we did yesterday in the Making Ontario Open for Business Act is absolutely the right way to go to get our economy moving again. When when Bill 148 was brought in, we lost 52,000 jobs in January. In August, we lost over 80,000 jobs, and most of those, for the first time in my 28 years, were part-time jobs. Why? Because of the equal pay provisions. In Bill 148, you had to have a part-timer paid the same, same as the person that's worked for you for 25 years. Businesses can't afford that. They laid people off in droves. Over 80,000 people they can't keep going the way they want us to go. Take your seats. Order. Order. Member for Niagara West, come to order. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's obvious that this government has no understanding that the value of a person's labour is the same regardless of that person, whether they're a part-time worker or a full-time worker. It's the value of the labour, Speaker. That should be equal. But I'm certain, I'm certain
certain that when the deputy premier needs a day off, she doesn't lose a day's pay. Speaker. Government and we order. know that this government is more than comfortable handing Conservative insiders million dollar pay packets. But when it comes to average working people, those standards don't apply. They're stuck working for poverty wages and have to choose between taking a sick day and losing a day's pay. Why does the government think that that's acceptable, Speaker? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and to the honourable member, I say what isn't acceptable is 80,000 people losing their jobs in August, 52,000 in January. What part of this don't you get? What part of going in the wrong direction don't you get? And why do you keep propping up as the Liberals were the directions the Liberals took this province? They took this province down the sewer, and you're helping to once again keep this province. I would remind all members to make their comments and their questions and their responses through the chair. Order. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Deputy Premier, but I'm going to state in this House what I've stated many times before. I will stand with working people before elections, during elections, and after elections, Speaker. And after People trying to make ends meet, Speaker, losing paid sick days is actually a big deal. It means losing Mr. a day's pay, and that can make a huge difference when it comes to paying the bills at the end of the month. The Deputy Premier doesn't lose a day's pay when she takes a sick day. Why must other workers, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's announcement was a great announcement. It sent here, here. to the world the message that Ontario is open for business. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. And the greatest benefit we can give to workers is reducing red tape to help create jobs in the province of Ontario so they have better paying jobs, Mr. Speaker. Better paying jobs. We have one of the highest minimum wages in Canada, and we're going to tie those ongoing increases to inflation, not politics, economics. That's what those increases are going to be tied to inflation. The best thing that we can do for the workers of the province of Ontario Pots. is provide better paying jobs and decreasing the unsightly cost of affordability in the province of Ontario. That's Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Here, most working people are just trying to make ends meet, and this feels to them like another cut they just can't afford. Right. One woman working four different minimum wage jobs was on the radio this morning, and she said that it felt like getting hit in the gut. The government seems quite happy taking away people's pay hikes or docking them a day's pay just because they get sick. Would the Deputy Premier uh, be willing to dock her paycheck when she gets sick, or better yet, to try living on the $14 minimum wage? Speaker? Mr. Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the recent election, in which uh, we received a large mandate from the province of Ontario and the people of the province of Ontario, they wanted life to be more affordable, Mr. Speaker. So we're making life more affordable. We're decreasing their cost of living. We're decreasing their hydro. We're decreasing their uh, gas bills. We're decreasing their home heating. Opposition, you know come what? to order. We are providing an environment, and many businesses are here today supporting our action of Open for Business Act, so that they can provide more jobs and better-paying jobs to those people, so they can afford to live in the province of Ontario. They can afford their groceries. They can afford their electric bills. That's what the people of the province of Ontario said in June. Make our lives more affordable. Give us better-paying jobs, and that's exactly what the piece of government. Yeah. Start the clock. Next question, member for Oakville North, Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Yesterday, the minister introduced the Making Ontario Open for Business Act. 
For the last 15 years, the previous Liberal government created unnecessary red tape. The hard truth is that the previous Liberal government was fixated on job regulation instead of job creation. Yep. Yeah. During our government's yeah. consultations across the province, businesses told us loud and clear that the regulatory burden is getting worse every year. This comes at a time when our largest competitor, the United States, is reducing the cost of business in a historic way. Could the minister please inform this legislature of how Ontario fell behind under the previous Liberal government? Good question. Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to my honourable colleague for the uh, question. Ontario has uh, slid rather badly. You know, we're used to thinking ourselves, Mr. Speaker, as being up there in the same league as New York and, and California. But a very disturbing uh, report, uh, recent report, using 2016 figures. A good measure of your economy is your GDP per capita, your production per capita. Uh, of the 64 jurisdictions in North America, so that's the 50 states, District of Columbia, 13 provinces. Out of, out of that ranking of 64, New York was third, California was ninth, and we were 46, Mr. Speaker. We used to be right up there with New York and California. We were 46. That's how badly the Liberal government brought us down. They didn't care about jobs. They brought in every regulation, piece of red tape they could. There wasn't a piece of red tape they didn't like, Mr. Speaker. They brought it in, they piled it up, piled it up, piled it up, and our job creators are going elsewhere. They're absolutely leaving, and our productivity's gone to the bottom third of all of North America, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Ontario was once the economic engine of Confederation, but that was before the opposition voted with the Win Liberals 97 per cent of the time. When the previous government introduced Order. Bill 148, they drowned Ontario in a tsunami of new regulations that imposed unnecessary costs on businesses. For Ontario job creators, it was too Order. much too soon. Yep. I'm proud of our government for the people for taking concrete measures to open Ontario for business and help create and protect good jobs in Ontario. Here, here. Could the minister please inform this legislature how the Making Ontario Open for Business Act will once again make Ontario a top-tier destination for job creation, investment, entrepreneurship and growth? Here, here. Minister. Thank you, thank you again, my colleague, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I mentioned uh, Ontario's GDP to uh, per capita uh, statistic, and across the way they're saying, "Why are you putting down Ontario?" We need to be realistic and transparent with the people of Ontario. They have their heads in the sand over there, Mr. Speaker, just like the Liberals did for 15 years. We're sliding badly. Jobs are going every day to Ohio and Michigan, to Quebec. Other provinces are doing. We're lagging four other provinces. We used to be, as the honourable member said, the economic engine of Canada. The Making Ontario Open for Business Act and getting rid of the job-killing parts of Bill 148 and opening up our trade sector and changing the ratios, those are all good things for good jobs and better jobs in the province of Ontario. And we need to do it. We need to do it now. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. The communities of Brampton, Markham, and Milton have been eagerly anticipating a new university campus. These campuses were an opportunity for young people to get a world-class education closer to home, and they were going to be centres of innovation that would grow the economies of these already fast-growing communities in the GTA. Years of tireless effort went into making these campuses a reality, but last night this government snatched that away without a word of warning. Is the minister prepared to reconsider this callous and short-sighted decision? Mr. Training Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I will repeat that we promise the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and part of that process means making tough decisions about projects across Ontario. Our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial mess and decisions of the previous Liberal government. 
We know, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, that the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government have caused this situation. The Liberals have shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on restoring trust. And I remind everyone that it is the NDP who supported the Liberals on 97 per cent of their votes. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Co Training Colleges and Universities, Markham, Milton and Brampton are some of the fastest growing cities in Canada, but they tend to be taken for granted by the government at Queen's Park. They are the only communities with over a million people in North America that do not have a university. These campuses were investments in a smart future to make these communities centres of the next generation of research and development and to create 21st century jobs. Why is the government breaking the promise to make that investment to these communities? Minister. Oh, sorry. Thank you again for that question, and thank you, Speaker. Well, I, I think we need, to, we need to understand that the financial situation that we are in, and we were elected to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. In an election year, the Liberals made empty political promises all across Ontario for programs and projects they knew that we could not afford, and hiding the costs from the public, creating a $15 billion deficit that Ontario is reeling from today. They shattered the trust of Ontarians, and our focus is on cleaning up the irresponsible and Position reckless financial decisions of the previous government. We are working on restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances and our future. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister, October is Manufacturing Month. It serves as an important as an opportunity for government to come together with industry, labour, chambers of commerce professional associations, and educational institutions to recognize the vital role this sector plays in day-to-day -day lives of Ontarians. The manufacturing sector employs around 760,000 people in Ontario and makes up about 12 percent of our province's GDP. It is safe to say that the manufacturing industry is an important driver in our province's prosperity. Could the minister please tell the legislature of what our government for the people is doing to stand up for manufacturing jobs in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, and thank you to my honourable colleague for the question. Um, as all members know, manufacturing took quite a hit over the last uh, few years under the uh, previous Liberal government. 320,000 jobs, manufacturing jobs, good paying jobs were lost between 2003 2009. And since that date, we've seen a steady decline, and we're still counting how many more thousands of jobs we've lost in the manufacturing sector. I've had numerous opportunities, Mr. Speaker, along with colleagues uh, in my capacity as minister, to tour a number of uh, our great manufacturers that are still here in the province, General Motors, Linamar, Ford, Toyota, Honda in my own riding. And yesterday, Minister Scott and Fullerton, uh, Scott and, Fullerton and I uh, visited Leyland Industries. I want to thank them for their hospitality. All of these businesses told us we needed to get rid of the job-killing parts of Bill 141 that they weren't able to hire uh, new people. Ponce. They couldn't find apprentices. They needed the College of Trades ended. That's what we're doing through the Making Ontario Open for Business Act, and we're very proud to be doing that on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Minister for his response. Back to the Minister. Ontario is North America's manufacturing heartland and a world-class producer of automobiles, information technology, communications, biotech, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and many more goods. Ontario alone is the largest subnational automotive assembly jurisdiction in North America. Yes. Yesterday, our government for the people announced a key piece of legislation that is going to support our manufacturing industry and encourage companies to stay right here in Ontario. If passed, this legislation will create, will help businesses create jobs and expand. 
through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Honourable Minister. What is the government's message to companies like Leland and the entire automotive industry? Minister. Uh, thank you for the question. Our, our message to the automotive industry and to all of our job creators in the province, large or small, help is on the way. Ontario is open for business, Mr. Speaker. Not only is our government standing up for the manufacturing industry by reducing burdensome red tape, our government has scrapped the Liberal Cap and Trade Scheme. We scrapped the Green Energy Act. We promised to clean up the mess left behind at Hydro that the Liberals left behind. We're lowering taxes. And we're fighting the worst tax of all, the job-killing Trudeau carbon tax, the federal carbon tax. That will be a death knell for manufacturing in this province. That will undo all the good things we're trying to do through our Making Ontario Open for Business Act. Shame on the federal government. They need to rethink this punishing tax. It's not only punishing families, it's punishing jobs and our job creators. It's absolutely the wrong way to go. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in my community of Brampton, parents, students and even senior citizens were eagerly anticipating a new university campus. We were excited for this opportunity because we were finally being recognized as a fast-growing and world-class city that can provide educational opportunity focused on innovation, job creation, cybersecurity for the next generation. Years of tireless effort has gone into making this campus a reality, but in a blink of an eye, the work and planning has all been thrown out the window. Speaker, why is this government cancelling investments that are critical to our growth in Brampton? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite Please for that question. Oh, yeah. is this, this is on. Yep. Okay, Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. We promise the people of Ontario to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances, and part of that process means making tough decisions about projects across Ontario. Our government is being forced to clean up the irresponsible and reckless financial decisions of the previous Liberal government. And we know now, thanks to the Independent Commission of Inquiry, the depths of the waste and mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. Shameful. To describe Shameful. the previous government's actions, the Auditor General used words like conceal, bogus, deceptive and unreliable. In an election year, they made empty promises to Ontarians for programs and projects they knew they could not afford to a billion— Thank you. Supplementary. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you uh, very much, Minister, for that recording. I mean, uh, sorry, answer. Um, <laughs> Brampton is the ninth largest city in Canada, but it is constantly not getting its fair share. Millions of dollars have already gone into planning this university and our affiliated Centre for Innovation, not to mention the wasted time and effort from all of those involved in the project. These campuses were investments in boosting Brampton's economy, creating good-paying jobs, and opportunities for our young people closer to home. In fact, this was something that members on the uh, Brampton side of the government benches actually campaigned on. So why is this government treating and continuing to treat Brampton like a second-class city? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the members at opposite for that question. We've been clear that this government is committed to enhancing financial accountability and transparency. We owe our children a positive future. The previous Liberal government, propped up by NDP, who supported the Liberals on 97 per cent of their votes, made empty promises in an election year for programs and projects that they knew they could not afford, leading to a $15 billion deficit and hiding that from the public. The Liberals shattered the trust of Ontarians, and the NDP propped them up on their votes, 
and our focus is on restoring trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. That is important for our future. Thank you, Fonts. Speaker. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Market economies have shown a remarkable ability to support innovation and adapt to changing circumstances. Just think of the shift from horse to car travel a century ago. Market prices guide the decision that people and businesses make, influencing what items they choose to buy, produce, and sell. Does the Ford government believe in markets and the importance of market-based solutions? Deputy Premier. The Minister of Economic Development. Economic Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, but I sense a bit of a trap here from the honourable member. Uh, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out what you're up to over there, Michael. <laughs> the honourable member, I should say. So perhaps I'll just wait for the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, I believe, uh, Mr. Speaker, given the response I heard in questions around Bill 148, that the government does believe in market solutions. So if that's the case, why is the Premier wasting taxpayer dollars to fight a lawsuit against the federal government to bring in a market-based solution to, to address the climate crisis. Here's the bottom line, Mr. Speaker. If something is free, people will do more of it. If pollution is free, people will pollute more. It's basic economics supported by Nobel Prize winning economists. Even conservative policy analysts have shown that putting a price on pollution will reduce pollution and put more Question. money back in the pockets of hardworking people in Ontario so they can even save more by reducing the amount of pollution. So I ask one Minister. Environment, Conservation and Parks. To the environment. Sorry. The question had been referred to the Minister of Economic Development. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, through, through you to the member from Guelph. Um, we, do, we, we do know where the member from Guelph stands. Uh, the member for Guelph and the Green Party of Ontario are in favour of a $150 a tonne carbon tax. Now, now even, even Justin Trudeau, who is willing to put 11 cents on a, uh, on a litre of gas, um, isn't willing to put 35 cents on a litre of gas. But, but to give credit, that is, that, is where, that is where the member and his party are coming from. We understand the problem of climate change and we understand it needs solutions. Uh, we will be addressing those with a plan that balances the economy and the environment. But what we won't be doing is putting a 35 cent a litre charge on a litre of gasoline as the Green Party advocates. Fine. Thank you. Next question, the member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of, of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Yesterday, the country tuned in while Justin Trudeau announced he was fully prepared to impose a carbon tax on provinces without a carbon pricing system. Trudeau conceded this tax will put a burden on the people of Ontario. He stated, quote, Liberals will help Canadians adjust to this new reality. And in turn, he promised all residents the Liberals would then return funds back to them to ensure they would not be impacted by the increased cost. This sounds too good to be true. I've never heard of a tax that puts more money back in people's pockets. <laughs> Can the minister please tell us the truth Nigerian about Justin Prince. Houdini Trudeau's tax? <laughs> minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and I, th I thank through you the member from Barry Springwell Oro Medante for, for his insightful question. Um, Justin Trudeau's carbon tax is going to have an impact on people who drive cars. Justin Trudeau's carbon tax is going to have an impact on people who have to heat their homes. His carbon tax is going to have an impact and going to hurt families. 
It's going to hurt businesses and make them think twice of employing another employee. The president of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business gave warning that the outcome for small business, whether it's textile businesses, pizza businesses, or other business, is dire. It is not good for job creators. Mr. Speaker, this is not about a climate plan. This is about a tax. Yep. Mr. Speaker, the FAO made it clear last week, $648 per family by 2022. And anyone, Mr. Speaker, agreeing with the member, anyone who hears a politician Spons. say, I'm going to increase your taxes and give you more money, should think twice. Uh -huh. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the minister for his answer. I'm so proud to be part of a government that does not submit and is ready to do what it takes to fight against this imposition of a carbon tax. We've made it clear, we've made it crystal clear, we believe man-made climate change is real, and our province is being threatened because of it. We've seen extreme weather cause floods, fires, wind damage, and other, uh, much more. Our government has been clear that our environment is a priority, and we're ready to take action to minimize the effects. Trudeau claims his carbon tax is a proven method to minimize the symptoms of climate change. The Trudeau carbon tax will start at $20 per tonne in January and rise to $50 per tonne in 2022. Can the minister tell us, will this really make a difference? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member raises a, an excellent point. The Trudeau carbon tax will go to $50 a tonne. That's the $648 per family. But as the leader of the Green Party would agree, that's not an effective level for a carbon tax. If it's not $150 a tonne, causing a $0.35 cent increase in gas, then the economists who think a carbon tax is a good idea would, would agree. We don't agree, Mr. Speaker. When Justin Trudeau talks about a polluter, what he's talking about is a commuter. He's talking about moms and dads who have to drive their kids to hockey, who have to drive their kids to school. He's talking about punishing families. That's why we've been clear. We will fight the Trudeau carbon tax. We will join provinces like Saskatchewan, join six provinces now that disagree with the Trudeau carbon plan, and fight this carbon tax. We will fight it in the courts. We will all the resources in our power to stand ahead or stand against this tax that hurts families and hurts Ontario job creators. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Yesterday, the government announced their plan to force workers to get a doctor's note to prove that they're sick. But for years, doctors with the Ontario Medical Association have been very clear that when you're sick, you should be staying home not dragging yourself into work to avoid losing a day's pay, and definitely not dragging yourself into a doctor's office to get a note so you don't have to drag yourself into work. Our health care system is already stretched, and this will only give doctors more work. What is the justification for this move? Minister of Labour. Well, Thank you very much uh, for the question. And, and we realize <clears throat> that the, the doctors are stressed. We realize the medical system is stressed. I, I want to point out in the legislation it says a uh, medical note, a health practitioner, qualified health practitioner note. So there's certainly flexibility in but there also has to be accountability. Now not every work not every employer is gonna ask an employee for a medical note. This is very much up to the employee. But we found, we've, we've, we've you know, spoken across the province, heard feedback across the province, that there has to be some accountability when asked for by an employer. We said, broadly, a medical health practitioner's note. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope that answers uh, the question. It seems very reasonable on this side of the House for businesses. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, that response actually leaves us with more questions. And, and, and to add uh, onto this mess, the government isn't just taking away paid sick days. Under the proposed changes, the Employment Standards Act, people will now have fewer days off to deal with family tragedies. When a loved one passes away, the last thing anyone wants to worry about is whether they can take time off to attend their funeral. Amazingly, the change also says an employer can demand proof in situations of bereavement. Is this government seriously proposing that people have to produce a death certificate for their mother before they're allowed to go to her funeral in the province of Ontario?
Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's very disappointing that the Dear opposition Mommy. is demonizing businesses in the province of Ontario and making them Dear look to be that they don't care about their employees. That is Order. not what is going on in the province of Ontario. We have eight job opposition come to order. days for employees, similar to other provinces across the country. We have designated people when we're protecting every worker in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, with those job protected days. So I, I, I know the members opposite are upset that we've brought in a piece of legislation that puts Ontario open for businesses and get, makes workers gives workers the opportunity to have better employment. Mr. Speaker, maybe you should look at it that way. Order. 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 Start the clock. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. We often hear pleas from the opposition in the House, the opposition call for help to help the people of Ontario. On June 7th, the people of this province voted for a change, and our government intends to deliver to Ontarians. Ontarians are tired of dealing with years of mismanagement and government who wasn't listening. Now. They have a government who cares. Can the Minister of Environment tell the minister, members of this legislature how we intend to ensure the people of Etobicoke Lakeshore and this province, how, that, how this government will continue to fight for them? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Uh, yesterday, we did hear about Justin Trudeau's plan, a plan that, as I've talked about, will impose a $50 a ton, $648 a year charge on, uh, on Ontario families by 2022. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, like the, the leader of the Green Party, members of the opposition, members of the NDP, have talked about a $150 a ton charge. That charge, $0.35 cents a litre on gasoline. For the 73 per cent of Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, who heat their homes with natural gas, that's $263 a month more in natural gas charges. Ontario families just cannot afford that, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, as we promised during the campaign, we will be standing up to the federal government, joining other provinces, joining Saskatchewan, joining the other provinces against the carbon plan, who will be facing the federal government in court against this unconstitutional, regressive, job-killing carbon tax. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate knowing we have such a passionate minister heading the fight alongside our premier. Our Ontario voted for a government that would put their needs and their concerns first. Our government is holding true to our province promise and making sure that the people of Ontario are first in our thoughts in all decisions we make. Ontarians are far too smart to believe that Trudeau's rebates are anything more than a temporary vote-buying strategy that will be discarded once the election is over. I'm confident that our efforts we put in place will rid this province of the cap-and-trade carbon tax and ensure the Trudeau carbon tax is never imposed. Following the removal of the cap-and-trade tax, can the minister please update the House Question. on our plan to protect the environment for future generations in Etobicoke Lakeshore and the rest of the province? Question. Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore, I, I share her confidence that Ontarians will see through the sham of a government that's going to tax you more and put more money in your pockets, but she is also correct that we have to do our bit. Ontario has been a leader on the environmental front and will continue to be so. That's why we will bring forward a plan, a plan that balances the economy and the environment and made an Ontario solution that understands the importance of Ontario's job creators, but the, also the importance of the environment and make sure that the environment is protected. 
We are in the middle of an of a extensive consultation process now. For those who want to share their thoughts, I'd encourage them to do so at www.ontario.ca backslash climate change, where we're gathering thousands of inputs. And I will look forward to presenting a plan that families can count on to protect the environment, but also not attack their ability to live the lives they want to do, put more money back in their pockets, Fonts. a plan that supports Ontario families and the environment. Thank you. Next question, the member for Sudbury. The question is to the Minister of Labour. Now more than ever, workers in the province want to join a union, so it's not surprising the government is going to make that more difficult. Sure. Tens of thousands of workers won the right to a simple card check system, and that was in place for decades in the province before the previous Conservative government took the right away. Card certification for workers in the building service sector, the temp agency sector and home care sector became a reality just last year. New Democrats argued that it should extend to every sector. If a majority of workers sign a union card, you should have a union. Is making it harder to join a union what this Labour minister represents? Thanks, Labour. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, we did take back the uh, card-based certification for two. Uh, for, the, for the three uh, sectors that were put into Bill 148, and you know we restored it with the secret ballot, which is a pretty good uh, sign for democracy. Hey! Workers will still have a choice. Secret ballot is a good democratic choice, and we hope the member supports us on that. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Employers, uh, Mr. Labour. <laughs> People don't join unions. People join unions because they want to be treated fairly and they want to work safely. This government's dragging the province backwards. The government side has to come to order. He's right there, and I can't hear him. I apologize to the member for Sudbury. Put your question. I was yelling as loud as I could to be heard. I apologize for their behavior. People join unions because they want to be treated fairly and work safe. Order. Safely. Now dragging this province backwards, limited rights to first contract arbitration recently won by Labour will be repealed. First contract arbitration is often the only way to avoid disruption once workplaces unionize. What does the Minister of Labour have to say to the millions of unionized workers in need of protections now more than ever since the government is about to roll back their rights in a race to the bottom? Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's announcement was a good news announcement for workers and employers. Our government will remove the worst burdens on biz Ontario businesses, and while we're still preserving real benefits for Ontario workers, right. they still have rights. We're not taking those rights away, Mr. Speaker. Businesses Opposition have the confidence order. to succeed, and they're going to expand, and we're going to have better paying jobs in the province of Ontario and safe places to work. Mr. Speaker, this was a good news announcement yesterday for employers and employees, and the NDP should embrace those announcements. Members, take your seat. Start the clock. The member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, Many employees and job seekers are concerned about the burden of unnecessary and duplicative red tape and unaddressed skill gap, particularly in the skilled trades. This is why I'm pleased to hear that the government is moving forward 
with modernizing the Ontario College of Trades. Businesses and tradespeople have expressed to me face to face their frustration with the college and the fact that the previous Liberal government, they are not there, <laughs> failed to address the skill gap. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell us how modernized the Ontario College of Trade will deliver our government promise to create good jobs, make Ontario open for business again? Thank you. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question and their strong advocacy for the people of Markham Unionville. Here, here. We've heard loud and clear from employers and tradespeople that the Ontario College of Trades is not delivering as it's currently structured. Speaker, take example of Alberta. Despite being a third the size of Ontario, Alberta has 50,000 apprentices, wow. while Ontario has only 70,000. Meanwhile, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses has said there are 154,000 unfilled private sector jobs in Ontario. We need a system that gets Ontario's economy moving and fills the skills gap. Yep. We know people are prepared to work, and they deserve a Boss. shot at the job. Speaker, we promise the people of Ontario to create good jobs in Ontario. And I'm going to remind the member for Markham Unionville and all members that it's inappropriate to make reference to the absence of any member at any time. Supplementary. Start the call. Thank you, Mr. Minister, through you, Mr. Speaker, for your hard work in making Ontario open for business and modernizing the Ontario College of Trades. Here, here, here. I'm proud that, unlike the previous Liberal government, that we are focused on creating better jobs and filling the skills gap. Under the previous Liberal government, which was propped up by the NDP, yeah. Ontario lost 300,000 good manufacturing jobs. And the previous Liberal government hit the true size of Ontario's deficit, leaving our province the most stepped of subnational government in the world oh. and a 15 billion deficit. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell us more about how our government legislature, if passed, will increase access to trades and reduce the red tape on business and job seekers? Thank you. Restart the clock. Response, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our legislation, if passed, will wind down the Ontario College of Trades yeah. and work to find efficiencies to reduce red tape and duplication that exists in the current system. The current system is not working for the economy, employers, and tradespeople. We've heard from the tradespeople and employers that many of the roles and responsibilities are overly burdensome. For example, Apprentices must be registered in two separate systems, one with the ministry and one with the college. We know people are prepared to do the work, and they deserve a shot at the job. Yeah, here, here, here. We were elected on a promise to reduce red tape and create good jobs in Ontario. Speaker, promise made, promise, promise kept. kept. Member for London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. The crisis in Ontario's health care has been growing after decades of conservative and liberal mismanagement. The quality of care has declined, and wait lists are getting bigger every day while people's health suffer waiting for the care they need. Across Ontario, home care has been hit the hardest. Patients and workers are both feeling the squeeze. Home care PSWs are doing the very best they can, but many have low wages, do not have protections, and their work schedule is unpredictable. Families are asking, what is this government doing to address the needs of their loved ones who are waiting for home care? Mr. Health and Long -term care. 
Well, I thank the member very much for the question. I do agree with her that there has been a crisis that has developed in terms of resorting to hallway health care as a result of 15 years of inaction by the previous Liberal government. But we got elected to change that. We got elected to end hallway health care, and we've started action on that right now. We made an announcement several weeks ago about injecting an additional $90 million into the system to create 1,100 new spaces to get us through flu season while we are developing a long-term capacity plan. We are working on that right away. We also know that some of the reasons for wait times are because people are, are in hospitals, but they don't have anywhere to go. We know that we need to build more long-term care beds. We've already announced 6,000 of them are in production. But we know that home care is an increasingly important aspect of home care because most people want to go home when they are able to leave hospital. Home care provides those supports with the nurses, with the uh, PSWs, and the supports that people need. We are going to continue to build on that here, to make here. sure that people get the care that they need. Right. Supplementary. Speaker, the situation in home care needs to be fixed, and this government is not helping by taking things from bad to worse. Cuts and deregulating will not provide Ontarians with the quality care they deserve. Seniors in my riding of London Fancha are suffering while this government hesitates to continue the care and provide the home care services that people, the most vulnerable, are waiting for. When, this government, when will this government take the crisis in health care seriously and commit to providing the care that all Ontarians deserve and are expecting from this government? Thank you, Speaker. Well, I think it's important for all members in this legislature to note, as well as anyone who is watching these activities, that what we are doing is increasing health care in Ontario. We have indicated that through the and the investments that are happening across the board, the $3.8 billion that is going to be spent both federally and provincially to create a comprehensive and coordinated mental health and addiction system, because right now what we have is bits and pieces all over that don't connect with each other. I think it is really important to note that we want to augment our health care services because we know we have a rapidly aging population. We have new medications that are coming on board to combat rare diseases, which is wonderful. We are going to make sure that we have those resources for people when they need them. That is our priority. Once. Patient safety and patient concerns are a top priority for us on this side, and it's something that I work on every day in the ministry. Thank you. Next question. The member for Peterborough. Mr. Cumberland, Spe Peterborough South. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Education, each day on my way into work, I stop and usually see at least one school bus stopping to pick up young students in my riding. On occasion, I've been stopped behind these school buses as I see a lineup of students eagerly waiting to get on the bus to head into school to learn. They're always greeted by a smile, and parents are often there waving goodbye. Mr. Speaker, today is School Bus Driver Appreciation Day, part of School Bus Safety Awareness Week. On this day, I can't help but remember the many bus drivers that shaped my life growing up. I think of Keith, Wendy. These men and women end up leaving a lasting impression on young, young students' lives. Can the Minister of Education please tell me about how the Government of Ontario plans to support these men and women who are crucial parts of our education system? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to also thank the great member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. He's doing a great job on behalf of that sure riding. And I stand here today in front of you, Speaker, to share our sincere appreciation. On behalf of the Ontario PC government and Premier Doug Ford, I would like to thank school bus drivers across this province because we all know the, the important job that they take on twice a day on behalf of all of us as they make sure that their students get to school back and forth in a very safe manner. You know, it's interesting. Every day, school bus drivers' focus is ensuring nearly 800,000 students from across Ontario, they're getting to school every day, as I said, two times a day, 
and their role is particularly critical in rural and er northern Ontario. And I'd Response. like to share with you, Speaker, that we recognize how important their job is. And in fact, I'm pleased to say that by the end of this month, eligible school bus drivers will be receiving funding from the School Bus Re Driver Retention Program. That's a thank you, and it's recognition for the important role they have. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that excellent answer. Thank you to the minister for that excellent answer. I know that parents and families across my riding appreciate the hard-working men and women school bus drivers that get their that get their children to school on a day-to-day -day basis. Can the minister of transportation update this house on how many students rely on these services and what is being done to make sure that our most precious assets are able to complete? their journey each day from home to the classroom and back. To the Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you to my colleague for the question. As with every file that my ministry works on, safety is paramount, especially when it comes to our children. Our school bus drivers across the province do an excellent job of ensuring the safety of our students. Approximately 800,000 students in Ontario are transported back and forth to school every day, and our bus drivers travel 1.8 million kilometres each and every school day. I am pleased to inform the House that school buses continue to be one of the safest ways for our children to get to and from school. Students are about 70 times more likely to get to school safely than by travelling on a school bus than by travelling in a car. On School Bus Driver Appreciation Day, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our school bus drivers and to remind all drivers in Ontario Bons. of the importance of paying attention, leaving space, and being alert whenever they are approaching or passing a school bus. Thank you very much, Speaker. Next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. This government recently allowed the Financial Services Commission of Ontario to increase auto insurance rates by as much as 11.6 per cent. This is unacceptable and will hurt fairness in my community of York Southwestern, who are already being gorged in their auto insurance rates just because of where they live. Yeah. Why don't this government stand up to insurance companies, stop the rate increases, and finally end postal discrimination in auto insurance? Minister Finance. Well, I want to uh, thank the member for that uh, uh, question, and once again, it gives me a great opportunity to stand here and congratulate the MPP from Milton for his very, very hard work on this file. Our member from Milton has proposed a, uh, uh, an initiative that is a great way to combat discrimination in our auto system. Now that the member's uh, legislation is tabled, we truly look forward to working with him and industry stakeholders to ensure our auto insurance system meets the needs of Ontario's 10 million drivers. Speaker, the member from Milton has done the right thing the right way. He consulted with stakeholders right across the province and will help you bring relief to families across all areas of Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll ask the, the, again through you, uh, uh, Speaker, I'll ask the uh, Minister of Finance. Drivers in my community are being gorged by insurance companies. And it is about time that this government takes action. This is the fourth quarter in a row that the government has allowed auto insurance rates to increase. Shame. One step this government could take to, is to, to bring fairness back to auto insurance rates is to end postal code discrimination in premiums that penalizes good drivers just because of where they live. Will this government again, and I'll ask directly the Minister of Finance, finally stand up 
to insurance companies and support the NDP's bill that will end postal code discrimination in auto insurance rates. Minister. Well, uh, I think the member from uh, York South uh, Weston should realize, I, I realize you are new here, but you should know the history is that the insurance proposal from the Liberals was part of a deal made with the NDP. So this is exactly why we are where we are. It was a stretch goal, in her own words, that the former Premier made. So we'll certainly not be taking any insurance uh, lessons from the NDP. In the meantime, our Premier Doug Ford has made it very, very clear that our government is committed to ensuring fairness in rate setting, ending discriminatory practices, and working forward uh, towards a system that puts the driver first. Unlike the member from Brampton East, the NDP member from Brampton East, he wants rates to go up right across the rest of Ontario. We'll have none of that. Yeah. Members, please take your seats. That concludes question period for today. Point of order, the member for London Fanshawe. Some guests of the legislature from Home Care Ontario, Sue Vanderbent, the CEO of the organization, as well as this afternoon, I'll be meeting with Sally Harding, uh, Nightingale Nursing, Stephanie Hayes from One to One Rehab, and Bruce Mahoney from Home Instead Senior Care. So I'm uh, welcome to the legislature. And I look forward to meeting with you later this afternoon. Point of order, the member for Brantford Brant. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce my long-suffering wife and my oldest daughter, Joni and Lena, sitting up in the uh, public gallery on the east side. Of order, the member for London. Thank you, Speaker. I just very briefly wanted to introduce uh, Rob Murphy, uh, John Chapman, Chuck Sandrelay, and Brian Crow, who are from the Independent School Bus Drivers of Ontario Association. Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce my good friend Dasvinder Singh Cambodge, who's joining us here today. He'll actually be leaving uh, this weekend for Alberta. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for London Fanshawe has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning home care. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 13 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 34, an act to repeal the Green Energy Act 2009 and to amend the Electricity Act 1998 the Environmental Protection Act, the Planning Act, and various other statutes. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Members, please take their seats. On October 23, 2018, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty moved Government Notice of Motion No. 13 relating to allocation of time on Bill 34. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethan Fowler. Mr. Bethan Fowler. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Bolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoki. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoki. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Midas. Mr. Midas. Mr. Park. Mr. Park. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Kusendova. Mr. Kusendova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Gamari. Mr. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith. Peter Brokaw. Mr. Smith. Peter Brokaw. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapat. Mr. Canapat. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Robert. Mr. Robert. Mr. Guzzetto. Mr. Guzzetto. Mr. Baver. Mr. Baver. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. We should be song. We should be song. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbit. Mr. Tabbit. Mr. Van Tom. Mr. Van Tom. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamako. Mr. Mamako. Uh, Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Mr. Be Ms. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Hart. Mr. Hart. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Shrine. Mr. Shrine. The ayes are 71, the nays are 37. The ayes being 71 and the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.